Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, Facebook family and friends. What a joy to be able to welcome you today to this wonderful broadcast. You know, it's always a joy to serve you the grace of God to teach you the word of God. Just before we get into the service of today, I want to also mention, if you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship, where you're able to learn with other brethren and beyond learning, where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you're being selfish. You're denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. Fasting your seat bells right now as I take you into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. A believer does not need to break any foundation because the only foundation a believer has is Christ. You don't break Christ. Once you're born again, you're on a sure foundation. If things are not working, it's not because you are under a curse. It's not because you are not born again. No. Things may not be working because of certain miscalculations on your part or lack of skill or lack of sensitivity to when the Holy Ghost gave you direction. But it cannot be because there's a foundation. So that is a deception and it's fraud to the body of Christ. Join Drs. Abel and Rachel Daminer in New Christian Camp Meeting 2021 and Ask the Counselor with Michael Bush. Theme in Christ Realities. Ministering Dr. Abel Daminer. Date 31st January to 14th February 2021. Time Mondays to Saturdays 6 p.m. daily on Inspiration FM 105.9 Uyo, Comfort FM 95.1 Uyo, Excel FM 106.9 Uyo, Radio Aquaibo 90.5 Uyo, Unio FM 100.7 Uyo, and Heritage FM 104.9 and also live on Sundays 7.30 a.m. first service and 10.30 a.m. second service. Venue, Power City International, number 98 Wangibo Road, Uyo, Akwaibom State, Nigeria. You can also watch this programs live on Kingdom Live Network TV on your strong decoder or my TV decoder. You can also follow Abel Damino's Facebook page, Public Figure, as well as YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram handles to watch real time. Host, Doctors Abel and Rachel Damino. All right, we're still looking at the legal and the vital work of salvation. Have you enjoyed the series so far? Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 4. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. 
and that there is none other God but one. Next verse. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Next verse. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commended us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. So brother Paul now retires all the dietary laws of Moses. Whether we eat or we don't eat, it changes nothing. So he has retired bread. He has retired Passover feast because it's all about eating. Now he says whether we eat or we don't eat, it doesn't change anything. So he retires that. Look at verse 9 of the same First Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Next verse. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So brother Paul begins to deal with something here which is very important. So if he does, the brother who does not have knowledge he sees a brother who has knowledge eating food offered to idol. And the brother now be deceived to eat the same thing. Meanwhile, his conscience is weak. Why? Because he saw another brother whom he looks up to doing the same thing. Look at verse 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Next verse. But when you sin so against the brethren, and wound their conscience. Ye sin against Christ. Next verse 13. Wherefore. If meat make my brother to offend. I will eat no flesh. While the world standeth. Lest I make my brother to offend. So he now begins to talk about something. Please pay attention. Because listen. He's talking about idolatry. Okay. But he first of all tells you, the idolatry he's dealing with here is not an idol somewhere. He tells you there are no idols. He tells you those things don't exist. But he's dealing with idolatry. So he now retires the dietary laws of Moses. Then he begins to talk about my brother. I see my brother who is weak in faith. I can eat meat sacrifice to idols, but I don't want to wound my brother's conscience for whom Jesus died. So he has shifted the discourse from idols like charm or all those, you know, small, small things. He is moving to a, a discourse. Please follow this thought. The book of 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1 now. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Brother Paul is talking. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my walk in the Lord? Next verse. If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless, I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Brother Paul is moving into a discourse here that you need to pay attention. So what he's saying is we are free, but we are not free. That's what brother Paul is dealing with here. We are free, but we are not free. Now look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty only. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. This is the work of faith. The work, the work, W-A-L-K. This is the work of faith. Now, look at First Peter chapter 2 verse 16. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to serve your appetite. But by love, serve one another. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. But as the servants of God. So liberty becomes a servant 
to serve others with. Liberty, my liberty in Christ becomes a servant that I will use to serve others with. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 1 to 6. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And not ye my walk in the Lord. Next verse. If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless, I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Next verse. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Verse 4. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Kephas? Next verse. Or I only am Barnabas. Have not we power to forbear walking? He is examining the things that he can do. They are examining the things that are their rights. He said, I can, I can engage a sister. I can get a job. The fact that I'm an apostle doesn't mean I can't do what all of you are doing. I can get a job. I can engage a sister to get married to. I can lead about a wife. I can do all the things that you do. Now, he is explaining the areas where he too has liberty. Brother Paul, he's dealing with something very important here. Look at verse 14 and 15 of the same chapter 9. Even so, had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Meaning, I can also ask you to give to me. Next verse. But I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. Brother Paul is speaking now. Alright? So this is knowledge in operation. This is knowledge. Look at verse 27 of First Corinthians chapter 9. But I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a cast away. I myself shall be a cast away. He's dealing with the fact that he is going to put his body under, put his desires under, put his passion under, put his selfish appetites under, so that after preaching to others, he will not be a cast away. The word cast away there is disqualified from reward. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 14. What is brother Paul dealing with here? Wherefore, my dearly beloved, Flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Can you see what brother Paul was heading to? Flee from idolatry. He has told you that an idol is nothing. Then he begins to explain to you the liberty that you have in Christ. Then he begins to say, don't use that liberty to serve your flesh. But use that liberty as an occasion to serve others. He now begins to talk about walking in love. He begins to talk about preferring others above yourself. He explains all the areas where he too can take advantage of liberty for his own pleasure, which are his rights. But he has decided to put his body under so that after preaching to others, he will not be disqualified from the reward. Now, so in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Chapter 9, chapter 10. Brother Paul's thought is how he has waived his right in love. He is explaining in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, how that things that were his rights, he has waived them, not because they are wrong, but he has waived them because of love. Because he has decided to walk in love. Now, so idolatry in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, is when you put your appetite and desires ahead of another brother. Idolatry is you serving your appetite and desires at the detriment of a brother or a sister in Christ. When you use this knowledge of the world to serve fleshly lust. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 27. See what brother Paul told them in Corinth. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, if an unbeliever call you for birthday party, or they call you for naming ceremony, or they call you for house dedication, or a party, 
He said, if they bid you to come for a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever this is set before you, eat. Don't ask questions. Just eat it. Don't tell them where did you get it from. Just eat. For conscience sake. Just go there. They put the food before you. Descend on it. Eat it and go. For conscience sake. Don't ask questions. Just eat if you want to eat. Alright? Don't say, what is this? How many percent is inside? Just drink and go. But the Paul is explaining here. Don't be too inquisitive. Since you were not inquisitive to come for the party, anything they put before you, clear it. Stand up and go home. After all, you don't know what it was, but you ate food. Brother Paul is teaching something. I love Brother Paul. First Corinthians 10, 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake who showed it to you. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If when you take the bottle to drink, somebody says alcohol, drop it. Why? For his sake and for your conscience. But if nobody comment, ask no question. Eat and go. Are we together here? Brother Paul is dealing with something very important here. Pay attention. Now, so Paul begins to bring to our focus a higher knowledge, a higher law, a law that is superior to knowledge. The love law. The love law, love law will always consider the other person. The love law will always consider the other person. So you see, chapter 8, he talks about the love law. Chapter 10, when he talks about food, again, he brings in the love law. If you observe chapter 8, he says, Some, not all, some have this knowledge. And some have not this knowledge in chapter 8. So since there are some that don't have this knowledge, what did he say you should do to them? Consider them. Chapter 8. Consider those who don't have this knowledge. Chapter 9. I will act as though I am under the law for the sake of others. I will act as though, even though I'm not under the law, but I will act as though if occasion demands, as if I'm under the law, even though I am not under. Then in chapter 10, it says, same thing. For those who believe that food is idols, he said, for their sake, don't eat it. If they are not there, eat it, it means nothing. But when they are there, because of their weakness, don't eat it. Why? Because you don't want to offend. It's like this question. Can a Christian drink alcohol? It's a tough question. You know why it's tough? Because it's not supposed to be a question. <laughs> it's not supposed to be a question. That's why it's tough. Can I do without Golda? Is there, an, is there alcohol called Golda? Can I do without Golda? Yes. I have done without it all my life. I have lived without Golda all my life. So, it's nothing to me. But if I see a Christian drinking Golda, I will not stop him. And I will not look at him like, look at that brother. No. No. It changes nothing. It's his choice. But I will not. Why? Because I'm considering others. But because I'm in knowledge, if I see him drinking, it won't affect me. The only person his alcohol will affect is somebody weak. I'm not weak. He's dealing with love work. Brother Paul is dealing with love work here now. Because he's talking to believers how to operate with each other in consideration. We do not serve our flesh and our appetite. You're going to get married. Do it in the right way. Don't plan to get married. Then you're not married. You and the lady start living together in the same house. Others may think too of you are doing Bible study. But unbelievers know that if a man and a woman are living in a room, it is not Bible study. And for their sake, you will not live together. Why? You don't want to offend. You don't want to hurt. You will do it the right way. So that your, your home will be honored by those around. And so that your marriage will be a testimony for your Christian life. 
Brother Paul is dealing with conduct here. Don't just say, well, me and her, we've agreed to marry. Our parents don't mind. Let's just start living together. Mm -mm, don't do that. You are acting contrary. You are actually in idol worship. Because you are, you are serving your desires at the detriment of brethren. That's what Brother Paul called idolatry. He's not talking about some shrine somewhere. He's talking about serving your appetite at the detriment of a brother or a sister. I will not do it. Because I'm considering my brother. I'm considering my sister. So brother Paul begins to introduce love. He said, when you sin against this brother in the name of I know the word. He said, you have wounded his conscience and you have sinned against Christ. When people hear, once saved, always saved. Some people just think, well, since once saved is always saved. It's a license for me to live anyhow. Anyhow, uh, you know, somebody told his wife, if, if you like, go and tell, go and tell pastor, go and tell pastor, if you like, uh, I'm not, I'm not moved. I'm not moved after all. I'm saved. I'm saved forever. There's nothing I can do that will spoil it. All right. That person is in idol worship. He is an idol worshiper. He's in idolatry. He is satisfying his appetite at the detriment of the message, at the detriment of his wife at the detriment of the neighbors around. It's brothers, like brothers who beat their wives. Or wives who beat their, their husbands. Because it's not only men that beat women. You know, you're busy beating your wife. Then when you people are at peace, they hear you people praying. Then tomorrow you're beating each other in the house. And you expect your neighbors to believe your gospel. You are putting up a stumbling block for their salvation. You are wounding the conscience of the weak for whom Christ died. Yeah. So now, he's dealing with, you know, how we relate. How we live our lives. How we relate with each other so that we are able to be a blessing. And we are able to be exemplary for people to see what God is doing through us. So Paul began to teach that simple principle of liberty called love. The principle of liberty called love. Loving the other person. One of the things that the new creation does is into the spirit of man is that you are now less selfish. Once you are born of God, you are now less selfish. You don't think self, me, mine, our first. You think about others. You think about how to be a blessing, how to be an inspiration because you are now born of God. You know, most times when you hear the pastors break away from churches, it is all rooted in selfishness. When you see a marriage breakdown, a husband divorces his wife, or the wife divorces her husband, or husband and wife always having misunderstanding, somebody has decided to serve an idol of selfishness. Either the wife has decided to serve an idol of selfishness, or the husband has decided to serve an idol of selfishness. Somebody is serving self. Or you see a relationship where a, a team of people are doing business and they're doing well. And then suddenly they start fighting and taking each other to court. Somebody in that team has decided to worship an idol of selfishness. Gratifying my desires at the expense of a relationship that will have been a blessing to me and a blessing to others. Somebody is having selfishness. And you know most times even in marriages when husband and wives have issues and they break away it is the children that suffer. Most times it's the children, the innocent children. You see them running to daddy, daddy will say go to mommy, mommy will say go to daddy. Those innocent children are running up and down and they're the ones who suffer at the end of the day and it is selfishness. Selfishness either on the part of the man or the woman on the part of both parties. So most times in the body of Christ when there's tension and misunderstanding and when there's crisis it is because somebody has decided to worship an idol a self-created self-indulged idol of selfishness so paul said do not use this liberty of yours as an occasion to serve the flesh but in love in love serve one another so if you come to this light of redemption it is an access for you to be a blessing to others it is an access for you to be a blessing to others. Once you use the liberty to serve your flesh, you are in idol worship. Once you use your liberty to serve your flesh, you are in idol worship. And the Bible talks about people whose God is their belly. Whose God is their belly. 
serving their appetite, using God's word as a cover. So, having expansiated that a man should walk in love toward others, Brother Paul now says, there's nothing in meat and drink. There's nothing in meat and drink. But look, if they tell you that that food was dedicated to an idol, don't take it so that you don't wound a brother. But there's nothing in the food. You're not avoiding it because you're afraid. You're avoiding it because you're in consideration of others. But the issue is not meat and drink. The issue is in the consciousness of it. You know, it's just like bread. You know, what people call the communion. Most of them just eat it. They don't even know what they're eating it there for. So what was the communion that brother Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians? So he begins to bring out love from knowledge. If an unbeliever beats you to a feast, go. Eat whatever they give you, asking no questions. For conscience sake. What is conscience? Conscience is a product of the knowledge available to you. Your conscience is formed by the knowledge you are exposed to. A weak conscience is a man who doesn't know the word. A man that has a weak conscience is a man that doesn't know the word of God. And there are many of them in the body of Christ. And we must love them. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Brother Paul now begins to talk about food. We have seen that these Gentiles were given to Jewish practices. Gentiles were a mixed breed of Jews and Gentiles. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Next verse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Next verse. There must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Sometimes when people leave a particular church, it's for good. And this is for pastors. Sometimes you have some members who just stand up and leave. It's for good. Because you, you, you should be thankful. Because you, God has just delivered you from something. You should be very grateful that they left. There are people that have to leave. Because they are not even part of the system. You know, sometimes it's a blessing that people leave. Because when they leave, you can see well. You know, when Lot left Abraham, then God said to Abraham, now look well. And Abraham saw very well. Sometimes when people leave, it's a blessing. And you must learn to be thankful at such times. And you must be discerning to know when people have left you and it's for blessing. Not just in churches, even in relationships. There are times people just betray you and walk away. You should be grateful and, and you should pop some wine and do some celebration. Because there are some people, their exit from your life is the beginning of good things. And there are some people, their entry into your life is the beginning of trouble. And some other people, their entry into your life is an addition. And that's why you must be discerning. You know, and um, it's important. Look at verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 11. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Why did he say it was not a love feast. Because Lord's Supper means love feast. Why did he say when you come together, you are not gathering to eat love feast? Why did he say that? Look at verse 21 of the same chapter. For in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper. And one is hungry. And another is drunken. That is why it is not the Lord's Supper. Because some eat and some don't have. That cannot be love. That cannot be the Lord. Look at verse 22 to 28. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Next verse. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Next verse. And when he had given thanks he broke it and said take it. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Next verse. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me next verse for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the lost dead till he comes all right now wherefore 
whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. Next verse. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now pay attention. Verse 29 now. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body. Now pay attention to the next verse. Verse 30. For this cause, many are sick, weak among you, and many sleep. 31. For if we will judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Tarry one for another. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, Paul deals with two streams. 8, 9, 10, two streams of the gospel. Number one, he dealt with discernment. Discernment. We know. We know. So he dealt with discernment. The first thing we know about the body of Jesus. That the body of Jesus has been broken for our sins and sickness. We know that. Second thing, he deals with love. Knowledge, love. In chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. He deals with knowledge and love. So, he teaches two different things. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, 9, 10, 11. Two different things. 1 Corinthians... Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Here again, he zeroes in on the lost body. Why? If you follow very well the gospel of Paul, when he mentions the body of the Lord, he is talking about the body of Christ. Let me show you. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So he deals with fellowship. A fellowship with the body of Christ. The word communion means our fellowship. Look at verse 17. So you know that is dealing with our fellowship. For we be many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. So he brings out love. In what he is saying. One bread. One body. One bread. One body. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. You will see that the body refers to the body of Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. One bread. So there are two things that can be seen in what brother Paul is teaching. Because he teaches it clearly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 29 to 30. How can I see the lost body in the scripture? Number one. Brother Paul teaches that we see the lost body as sacrifice. His body was broken for our sicknesses. For our sin as sacrifice. Number two. What I share with anyone that believes in Jesus. That, that which we share with one another. The body of Christ. So he says, for this sake, many are sick and weak among you and many sleep. Look at 1 Corinthians 11.33. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. That's love feast. Tarry one for another. What is that? Love. Love. He's teaching love. Wait, don't eat. Ask, who has not yet gotten food? Go around. Ensure that everybody has something to eat. He's bringing out the law of love. So we are to look at this in two ways. If we say we are referring to Jesus' his body, bearing our sickness and sin, it is 100% correct. Also, if we say his body is symbolic of our unity in faith, it's also correct. So we have two things to deal with in the body of the Lord. 
Number one, we deal with knowledge. Number two, we deal with love. The body of Christ is love and knowledge. Or knowledge and love. Those are the messages Brother Paul took time to teach the church at Corinth. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Next verse. And such trust have we through Christ to God the world. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the later, but of the Spirit. For the later killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Seven. But if the ministration of death, written and engraving in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly Behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So what we have in the New Testament is the ministry of the Spirit. In the New Testament, we don't have elements and articles. The New Testament is a ministry of the Spirit. And how we minister the Spirit is words. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and life. Words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So the ministry of the spirit is the ministry of words. Please, that's very important. That which was put on stones is inscribed today in our spirit. Making a distinction between that which was communicated in the flesh, which is elements, bread, ribena, bottle of oil, handkerchief, all that is the ministry of the flesh. Then we have the ministry of the spirit written in our hearts. Look at verse 9 of that chapter. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Next verse. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. By reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Next verse. And not as Moses, not as Moses which put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. All the rituals are abolished. Everything that came with the law of Moses is abolished. The end of that which is abolished. Now, what it was saying was hidden to everybody. All of them in the Old Testament. None of them could see it. I have not seen, I have not heard, neither has it occurred to the hearts of men, the things that God has prepared for those whom he loves. Look at verse 14 of that same chapter. But their minds were blinded. None of them could understand any of those communications. Their minds were blinded. For until this day, remained the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ? The truth is, there was a message of the Old Testament that they didn't see because they were men of the flesh. It was engraving in stones for them. Moses knew it. So, there was a veil upon their heart. It says that the veil is only done away in Christ. Glory to God. The veil is only done away in Christ. So, whatever was hidden in those ceremonies, Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, first fruit, all the feasts, whatever was hidden in them 
water baptism is taken away in Christ. The moment you come to Christ, all those rituals lose relevance. He is saying, until this day, they still read Moses with the veil. They are still looking at Moses' writings and seeing rituals. What about baptism? Holy communion or Passover, Pentecost. They are still reading it with the veil. They, they are still men of the senses. The same way the people in the law of Moses could not understand the message because they too have entered the state of those people. They too cannot understand the message. Why? Because the New Testament is a testament of revelation by the Spirit. It's not a testament of articles and physical things. So, he says, until this day, the veil is there. He says that that veil is only done away when a man looks at Christ. Until today, when Moses is read, there is a veil upon their hearts. But look at verse 16 of that Second Corinthians, verse 16. Nevertheless, when the heart of the man shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The veil shall be taken away. When one shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken. That is, there is understanding of the Old Testament for the man in Christ. That is, the man in Christ will see what they didn't see because he has revelation knowledge. Now, look at verse 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit. Which spirit? The ministration of the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why is there liberty? The veil has been taken away. There is liberty. Verse 18. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So where do we see the glory? Old Testament. We are changed from the glory of the Old Testament rituals, all the symbols, all the elements. We are changed from that glory to the glory of the new, even the glory of the Spirit of God. We are changed from the later that kill it to the glory of the Spirit. We are changed from senses to revelation as we behold the glory as in a mirror that is we behold the glory of the lord when the veil is taken away how is the veil taken away by christ the moment we see christ all the shadows lose relevance the veil is taken away and then as we read now it's a transformation that is what happened when the eunuch and philip met they read from isaiah Beginning from that scripture, Philip revealed Christ to the man. So Christ takes away the veil of the Old Testament. Christ takes away the veil of the Old Testament. He takes away the ceremony and brings in the reality. So the key thing about the New Testament is, the New Testament takes us from the senses to the spirit. The New Testament takes us from the senses to the spirit. We come from inside to the outside. Not from outside to the inside. Because what was done outside had no effect on the spirit man. What was done outside in the law had no effect on the spirit man. If the offering that they gave year by year made them perfect. They will not need the New Testament. But Christ has come once. Gave an offering once. Died once. Rose once. And our hearts have been purged once. Our hearts, evil conscience, has been purged out of us. So now that our hearts are purged from evil conscience, we can serve the living God. We can serve the living God. Hallelujah. There is no revelation. We are the revelation people. Revelation that comes to the man that is born again. So today, the bread and the wine has been unveiled. 
Because where it was veiled in the Old Testament, it is unveiled in the New Testament that the bread and the wine is a person. And the day you receive that person, you entered eternal communion. Eternal. And that communion is forever. You and Christ. Hallelujah. It has been unveiled. So we have seen the body and the blood of Jesus. That is what Christ has done for us. So the body of Jesus is sacrificial in nature. As touching sin and sickness. And the body of Jesus also speaks of our oneness in the faith. Our oneness in the faith. So, as I speak of Christ, I am eternally identifying with a brother. When I'm speaking of Christ, I'm identifying with you. Because when I say Christ, I'm saying you. He's in you. He's in me. So when I talk about Christ, I'm identifying with a brother. I'm aden Our unifying force is Christ. What ties all of us together as the body is Christ. No one is inferior. No one is superior. I will speak of Christ. Then when I speak of Christ, I will find out. Bro, have you eaten today? No, take this for food. I will speak of Christ. Oh, sister, are you okay? No, I'm not well. Oh, what can we do? Okay, let's pray. Then let's get to the hospital. I will take her to the hospital. I will assist where I can. Why? That is how we function in knowledge. And by that knowledge, we serve one another. You can't be saying, I am in Christ. I have revelation knowledge. And you're not bothered about brethren. You're wounding brethren. No. Your knowledge is not edification knowledge. It's pride knowledge. Because knowledge is supposed to edify, not to puff. Carnal knowledge puffs. Revealed knowledge edifies. Yeah. Our love walk. Our love walk. Our love walk. Our love walk. That means the same way I am speaking it, I am also demonstrating it. To myself. I'm not denying that brother of his oneness with me. The same way I know I should eat, I also know my brother should eat. The same way I know things should be good for me, I also know that things should be good for my brother. The same way as I see the body of Christ as the offering for sickness and sin, I must be able to discern it. I discern. And when symptoms come, I resist them. If a brother is going through symptoms, I identify with that brother and we resist the symptoms together. So we are dealing with two laws in the book of Corinthians. The law of knowledge and the law of love. So while I am taking the bread by speaking, two things are happening. I must be able to discern the lost body. That the body of the Lord is broken for sin and sickness. Then number two. Because I discern the lost body, I'm able to look after my brother and look after my sister to ensure that they too are well taken care of. So for me not to share, it means I don't see it as the lost body. A brother is in need and you refuse to bother because you have refused to discern that that brother is the lost body. A sister is in need and you pretend not to know. You have decided to be insensitive because you are either not considering yourself to be the lost body or that brother or sister to be the lost body. I must be able to distinguish. Brother Paul took time and says, look, I will not concentrate on my appetite at the detriment of a brother. So brother Paul teaches a variety of things together. In the book of Corinthians. Because what we did today is an overview of the whole book. He's teaching a variety of things. Number one. He's teaching knowledge about the Passover. Knowledge about the Passover. Number two. He teaches love for one another. Right from chapter 8. Chapter 9. Chapter 10. Chapter 11. 
So in 1 Corinthians 10, it now says that the essence of all that eating, baptized to Moses, baptized in the cloud, baptized in the sea, he now says it is knowledge of Christ. He says in Christ, the liberty that we have. I'm free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah. But now you turn and use the liberty as a tool to serve the brethren. To serve the purpose of God. To serve the mission of God on the earth. If I go to where they are eating, I will eat with them. And use the opportunity to teach them Christ. The knowledge you have is not to serve the flesh, but to serve others. If you are truly growing, you can act as if you are under the law. You know what I mean? You go to a church where everybody is tying scarf. You tie your scarf and sit down. What's your problem? It doesn't take anything from you. Once the scarf is over, you remove the scarf and throw it away. You go to a church where they say you cannot enter until you wear a cap. You wear a, long, a very big cap that will make everybody know you have arrived. You know? You go to somewhere, they say, no, you will not preach to us until first of all, you tie rapper. You say, please, can I borrow one? You collect and tie. You preach. When you're true, you give them their rapper and go. It's nothing taken from you because you've matured. You've grown. You become all things to all men. Why? That you may win them. That's a higher law. That's, that's the realm. That's the realm, brother Paul, is teaching this church to function in. So, the body of Jesus speaks of his sanctification and sacrifice for us. The body of Jesus speaks of our union with one another. So, we must see it from a total perspective of God's word. The old covenant is a practice. But right in it, you will see the new covenant. Right in the practices, you will see that it is pointing to the new covenant. For example, David was hungry. <laughs> you know, he entered the temple where he's not supposed to enter. Where only high priests are supposed to enter. He enters the temple, takes shoe bread with his boys. They ate and walked away. David in the Old Testament was already operating New Testament. Because when you look at the Old Testament very clearly, it points you to the New Testament. It points you to what Christ has done. It points you to the finished work of Christ. Alright? So, Exodus 15, 26. As I close this service. Blessed. Glory to God. And said if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. And will do that which is right in his sight. And will give ear to his commandments. And keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee. Which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Rapha. Remember. Forty years. Kayadaba. Forty years. Nobody was sick. Old covenant. 40 years. Nobody was sick. 40. Their shoe never grew old. 40 years. Even though they were disobedient. They were rebellious. Yet he looked after them. They were rebellious. Yet God looked after them. Who told you? That the reason why you are sick is because you are not obeying God. Who told you? All the people Jesus healed in the four gospels were sinners. In fact, there's a particular person Jesus healed. He said, do you believe I will heal you? He said, I don't believe, but help my unbelief. And Jesus healed him. Somebody said, 10 keys to healing. It's fraud. There are no keys. There are no keys. There are no keys. Jesus healed them all. How many did Jesus heal? All. Without asking questions. He never said, are you born again? Are you living holy? What about righteous? When did you lie last? No. What do you want? Sight. Take. What do you want? I want to hear. Receive. What do you want? I want to walk. Rise up. Take your mat and go. What do you want? Some even touched him without him knowing. They came from behind. Touch him. God, they are healing. And even left. Then he stopped. Somebody touched me. He used the woman to teach how to receive. He used her to teach how to receive. She believed it. She said it. She touched him. She received it. She believed him. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know. She came from behind. She touched him. The blood stopped. And she testified. Jesus said, somebody, she came. And he looked at her and said, daughter, 
the kind of faith you have demonstrated has made you a daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. All the places where Jesus healed, it was their faith. Not their holiness. Not their good behavior. Your faith. Your faith. Do you know that even in Acts chapter 3, when Jesus healed, I mean, when, when the gate man, the man at the gate, beautiful, was healed. The man, you know, was jumping everywhere. And people are looking at Peter and John as some superheroes. As some wonderful Peter. P Peter and John say, hey, gentlemen, even we, we are surprised. We are surprised that the man is walking. Why are you looking on us? As though it's by our power or our holiness. This man, the faith that is in him has made him walk. Am I talking to somebody here? The faith that is in him. If there's a man to believe, there's a God to perform. For unto she that believeth, there shall be a performance. She touched, she was made whole. Somebody shout, I hear you. Healing is an act of God's love. Healing is an act of God's love. The moment you want to receive healing and you are thinking of your sin, you have left love and gone to law. You have left love and you have gone to the law. In Hebrews 12, 2, look away from Jeremiah. Look away from Isaiah. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Jesus himself bore our infirmities. He bore our diseases. He bore our sicknesses. By his stripes, we are healed. We speak of the healing and much more. We speak of our union in the body of Christ. We stand with one another. We strengthen one another. We encourage one another. We are there for one another. We defend one another. And we strengthen one another. One body, one blood, one blood, one God, one faith, one baptism. All of us drank of the same spirit. Bone of his bones. Flesh of his flesh. He that touched you touched God's eyes. The apple of God's eyes. You and the Lord are one spirit. What cannot fight him cannot fight you. What cannot defeat him cannot defeat you. Hey, I'm an ask, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Inseparable union. You in him. He in you. Zapato kata. Your body, his temple. You are the residential address of Jehovah. Deity lives on your inside. That's what we have. That's our reality in Christ. What cannot stop him cannot stop me. He cannot be sick. I cannot be sick. My body has been bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God. So, the devil, you are, the devil, your adversary, goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Whom you, you, resist him steadfast in the faith. Resist the devil and he will argue. What does your Bible say? Resist the devil and he will argue. He will flee. Don't fight darkness. Don't fight darkness. Some of you, the reason why you have not been able to overcome sin and addiction is because you are fighting darkness. You will fight till you die without winning. Nobody fights darkness. When a room is full of thick darkness, turn the light switch on. Turn the light switch on. The moment light enters, darkness goes out instantly. Wherever there is darkness, put the light there. What is light? The entrance of his world. Give it light. And it give it understanding to the simple. A woman told me a few years ago, my husband is always smoking. He smokes and smokes and smokes and the doctors have told him his heart is at risk. His body is at risk. His health is at risk. I keep telling him. He too sometimes he will say, honey, I don't want to. I don't want to. But he cannot overcome it. I say, bring your husband to me. I say, hey, Mr. Man, look at me. Look at me. Look, look at me. Stop fighting darkness. If you fight, you'll be tired. Nobody fights darkness. Stop. Stop trying not to smoke. Stop. Don't try again. Smoke. Stop trying. 
Because if trying will do it, you will have succeeded. So stop. While you are smoking, carry the word of God. Start spending hours. Listen to my teaching. Listen. One hour, two hours, three hours. Take a smoke break. Smoke. Come back. Listen. Listen. Within one week, the man came back. The man came back within one week. He said, in the course of listening, the appetite for smoking. Suddenly, I saw that I was too clean for those ashes to permeate my body. The entrance of his world, it giveth light. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set free. You know what? Leave that addict in the hands of the truth. Let the truth do what only the truth knows how to do. Stop fighting darkness. Introduce light. It is called dominion. Somebody shout dominion. Somebody shout I dominate. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you. The way to overcome darkness is to introduce light. The entrance of his word. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them. And hell to all their flesh. The word of God frees men from addictions. The word of God frees men from captivity. Uh -uh. You heard the man that said, I have been a homosexual for close to 30 years now. I believe that I was created to go after men. I have never had a desire for women. Never. Never. He said, but as I started listening and following the message of Christ, as I started listening, suddenly a desire for women started rising. The desire for men has gone. Can I approach a sister? Is it okay? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? My brother, move and advance. Take over and conquer a territory. Shout glory, somebody. That is the liberty we have in Christ. Somebody shout glory. We have something to shout about. We have something to dance about. We have something to brag about. It is called the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Shout, I hear you. Lift your right hands. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. Addictions be broken. Addictions be broken. Addictions be broken. Wrong appetites be destroyed. Be flushed out. Be flushed out. Wrong appetites be flushed out. In the name of Jesus, sick bodies be healed. We declare liberty for everybody connected to this service. Liberty for your body. Liberty for your mind. Liberty for your body. All the wrong appetites, we command them flushed out. We command new appetites. Appetite for the world. Appetite for the world. Come alive. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise for victory. We give you praise for testimonies. We give you praise for freedom. Chains breaking, barriers terminated, men loosed, mental cages broken, mental cages broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that comes with your word. We give you praise in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. A believer does not need to break any foundation. Because the only foundation a believer has is Christ. You don't break Christ. Once you are born again, you are on a sure foundation. If things are not working, it's not because you are under a curse. It's not because you are not born again. No. Things may not be working because of certain miscalculations on your part. Or lack of skill. Or lack of sensitivity to when the Holy Ghost gave you direction. But it cannot be because there's a foundation. So that is a deception. And it's fraud to the body of Christ. Join Drs. Abel and Rachel Daminer in New Christian Camp Meeting 2021 and Ask the Counselor with Michael Bush. Theme in Christ Realities. Ministering Dr. Abel Daminer. Date 
31st January to 14th February 2021. Time, Mondays to Saturdays, 6 p.m. daily on Inspiration FM 105.9 Uyo, Comfort FM 95.1 Uyo, Excel FM 106.9 Uyo, Radio Aquaibo 90.5 Uyo, Unoyo FM 100.7 Uyo, and Heritage FM 104.9 and also live on Sundays, 7.30 a.m. first service and 10.30 a.m. second service. Venue, Power City International, number 98, Wangibo Road, Uyo, Akwaibom State, Nigeria. You can also watch this programs live on Kingdom Live Network TV on your strong decoder or my TV decoder. You can also follow Abel Damino's Facebook page, Public Figure, as well as YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram handles to watch real time. Host. Doctors Abel and Rachel Damino. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service, what a word. I believe you've been impacted, affected with the word of his grace. Listen very carefully. It is God's intent for you to continue walking in this light. So I'm going to encourage you to keep following. Remember, every day we're live right here on Facebook and YouTube every day. 12 noon GMT plus 1, 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. If you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship, where you're able to learn with other brethren and beyond learning, where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you're being selfish. You're denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. It's such a joy to be able to serve you the grace of God. My prayer for you is that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light, that the reality of Christ will resonate in your mind. We rebuke sickness, disease, oppression. We come against whatever is not planted by God in your heart today. We command it rooted out. And Father, we thank you for miracles, healings, and testimonies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen to your victory station.